Hi everyone. Today I'm going to be diving into the second book in the tarot sequence. Uh, that is The Hanged Man by Katie Edwards. This book is what made me fall in love with this series. Uh, the first one was great, lots of action, really enjoyed it, but it was basically a way to get you familiarized with the world and its characters. The second book I think is really why the author has shined. Um, still plenty of action in it, but it's gone back more to like the private investigator type series with lots of thriller scenes, lots of investigating, lots of secrets being spilled, lots of major players coming on the board, and even some new characters. So this book is my absolute favorite. I'm so excited to be talking about it today. Um, I'm actually going to divide it up into two different sections in this video. The first section, I'm just going to go over the major events that have ha that happens in this book. Uh, try to be as much spoiler free as I can. And in the second half, I'm going to go spoiler heavy with some detailed scenes that I want to talk about. Um, so this is the second book in the series. In the first one, at the very end of it, uh, you have Rune, uh, who managed to eliminate Ruick, who had been summoned by Ashton St. Gabriel. Rune kills him at the end of the book. Um, but because of these events, he ends up becoming quite famous. I mean, he was already famous to begin with, um, but he just basically popped up on everyone's board, you know, again. Um, so he's been, you know, in the newspapers, he's on TV, you know, quite famous after the events in the first book. Now, <clears throat> before you get into the second book, uh, Kate, the author, Katie Edwards, actually has a bunch of free stories online. A bunch of little novellas that you can read that involve the characters in these books. Uh, between the first book, The Last Son, and this book, The Hangman, there's actually a short novella he did called The Sunken Mall. Uh, it involves Kieran, Bran, Rune, Adam, Max, and Quinn. Uh, basically, uh, to sum up that little short story, um, the Lord Magician in the 1980s was in the process of trying to translocate a mall. I think it was called like the Worcester Galleria Mall, if I remember correctly. And during the translocation, it was lost. Um, Kieran happens to find it. So he goes with Rune, Bran, Adam, Max, and Quinn, and they all go on a treasure hunt to this sunken mall to basically find out what they can get their hands on. While they're there, uh, they encounter a group of elementals that are emulating Atlantean society. Uh, and specifically the arcana and while they're there they end up learning that these elementals uh, need some help they're being basically terrorized by some kind of monster in the sunken mall so they basically go on a quest to get rid of the monster and save these elementals now the short story is not imperative uh, to the main story you don't have to read it to understand what's going on in the second book it's just one of those good little side stories where you get to know the characters some more you know, you get to see Max and Quinn a lot more, you get to see Kieran, you get to see how Rune and Bran, how their typical missions go, how they act with each other, and you get to see a little bit more courtship between Adam and Rune. So, I really enjoyed it, it gives you a look more into the characters, very enjoyable, but not important to the story. So, after the first novel and after the events in the Sunken Wall, we had this book, uh, The Hanged Man. So at the beginning of this book, we're on Sun Estate with Rune and Brand. Uh, basically, Max had been going through some blueprints of Sun Estate, and he has discovered a secondary entrance to an attic, an attic they've not been in. Now, Sun Estate is the second most haunted place in New Atlantis. Far Strike Castle is the most haunted. Um, so Sun Estate is very dangerous. There's all kinds of bad creatures there that can cause you a lot of harm. Uh, so Rune and Brand typically don't go to Sun Estate unless they're in need of some money. In which case they go there to see what they can find and what they can sell and hawk. Um, so they're there to f try to figure out what's in this attic that Max has found. Uh, Brand stays in the parking lot. Sun, uh, Rune uses his uh, magic to basically levitate above the ground and make his way onto Sun Estate. He walks around. He stops by the carriage house and talks about the night that his uh, court fell. Uh, eventually he makes his way into the attic. Uh, he comes across a bunch of wardrobes, a bunch of chests. Inside one of the chests, he ends up coming across some manila folders. Um, in one of them, a picture falls out, looks just like Brand, but it is not Brand. 
Uh, he basically learns this is a file on Brand and his family and how his father, Lord Sun, chose Brand to be his companion. Um, of course, Rune becomes very upset by this, you know, and he's reminded that Rune did not have a choice in this life of being a companion. And he wonders what kind of life Brand would live if he hadn't been purchased by Lord Sun. Um, so he decides to take the folder with him. As he's closed in a chest, he ends up cutting himself. Blood drips onto the floor. Sun Estate starts going crazy. A bunch of whites, a uh, bunch of creatures known, known as whites. Uh, basically, they are in, kind of immortal type creatures, uh, but they eat feed off blood, basically, and they've been living off rodents, living in Sun Estate. Well, they smell Rune's blood. They decide to attack. Of course, Rune has a whole fight scene trying to get out of Sun Estate. He makes it out just fine, injured a little bit, almost died at the hands of a really old white. Um, but he makes it out, makes it back to Bran. Afterwards, they go to Sun Estate, and I think the chapter picks up with uh, Rune in bed, trying to sleep. Bran comes in, hops in bed, disturbs him, wakes him up. And basically, Bran is basically chastising Rune, saying that, you know, he shouldn't be, you know, texting Max to make him his personal butler to go get him some coffee. Of course, Rune is quite puzzled by this because he never texted Max to have him go get some coffee. Well, at that point, they know something's wrong. And so they head out of the house. Um, so basically, they believe this is an attempt at Lord Hangman to get, to get a hold of Max. Uh, we learned at the end of the first book that basically Elena Lovers, Arcana for the Lover's Throne, who is Max's grandmother, has basically promised him into a marital agreement with Lord Hangman. Now, they knew they would eventually have to deal with Lord Hangman and deal with this marital arrangement, but they're kind of hoping with the fall of the lover's court, they won't have to deal with him. So they haven't really been looking into it, haven't really dealt with it, but now that someone is supposedly, you know, texting Max and trying to get him out of the house, their only suspect is the Hangman. So... They end up basically running through the city, half naked. I think Brand's in like shorts and ten shorts, basically, and maybe a shirt. And uh, Rune, I think, is in his boxers. <laughs> uh, so they're running, trying to find Max. Eventually, they get a call from Quinn. Quinn is telling them basically get to the park, you know, which is a bit weird because Quinn is able to see possibilities. He's able to see the future. You think he would have seen all this? So either he didn't see. The Lord Hangman trying to come and get Max, or he knew it was going to happen, but he could only wait to a certain point to notify other people. Um, so basically, Quinn calls, tells them where to go. They head off to the park. Of course, when they get there, they find Max in the process of being kidnapped by Lord Hangman's uh, minions, basically. So Rune runs up to Agarda, uh, activates a child defense system in which shields go up. Uh, around the park, basically making sure that no one can enter or leave until a full contingent of Garda have arrived. Um, meanwhile, Rune and Bran, they engage in battle. They end up attacking uh, the Lord Hangman's minions. Most of them, I think, are killed. I don't, yeah, I don't think a single one was left alive at the end of the, that events in the park. But Max is a bit shell-shocked. They end up going back to the half house. And of course, Rune goes into Max's room and starts tearing it apart. Um, basically, Rune explains that the Lord Hangman is a very old arcana. He follows old traditions. Um, so while exploring the room, he comes across some letters that Max has been hiding. Apparently, the Lord Hangman has been sending marital letters to Max. Um, so basically, at this point, Rune becomes very upset. He thought there was some kind of waiting period. He would have some kind of grace to deal with this issue he no longer has that grace period. You know, the hangman is making his move. He's making his intentions known. You know, now that they've tried to abduct Max, it, things are just going to escalate from here. Um, and this is basically what this whole book is about, is dealing with Lord Hangman. So after the, this event, they find a card, of course, in one of the letters. So Rune reaches out to a man named Jervin. He is the senatorial uh, for the Lord Hangman. So they end up agreeing to meet in the park. Uh, Rune basically tells them to please desist uh, in his advances on Max. Jervin says no. And Jervin is a very scarred man. I guess he was tortured by Lord Hangman. Um, 
So Jervin is not easily scared by Rune and Bran and basically tells him, sorry, not going to happen. You know, the agreement has been made. The Lord Hangman wants Max. So afterwards, they go back to uh, go back to Half House. Rune and Bran uh, are talking and uh, Rune's trying to figure out some way out of this situation. How do you, how can he get close to the Lord Hangman? Possibly try to find some way to blackmail him to get him to give up his uh, advances on Max. That's when Rune tells him that ever since the events in the first book in which he took on Ruick, the Lich, um, that people have basically been contacting him, asking for assistance. People who can't afford to pay lots of money, you know, so they're just looking for your average person, good guy that could help them out. And then one of the people that contacted him was a woman by name Corrine Don Creek. She used to she is the companion for Kevin Don Creek, who was a scion um, in a lesser house, basically, and he was associated with the Sun Throne. Of course, Rune comes very upset by this. You know, everyone on Sun Estate died the evening his court was raided. Um, but the other houses, they were basically just the houses that were affiliated with the Sun Throne were basically just thrown to the wind. And, you know, if they were picked up by another house, great. If not, oh, well. And unfortunately, the Dawn Creeks was one of those houses. And I think they were actually, they were connect, affiliated with the Amberson family, which is a greater house who was connected to the Sun Throne. Um, so after the Sun, Cro Sun Throne fell and the court fell, the Ambersons were cast to the wind. And so were the Dawn Creeks family. They were cut off from the Ambersons, which there's some weird connections that I want to talk about later in the video. That's going to be major spoiler heavy. So basically, Rune and Bran decide to go meet with Corrine Dawn Creek. This is where we get to see some new characters entering the story. Um, we get to see Anna Dawn Creek, which is about a 12-year-old girl. We get to see Corby Dawn Creek, or Corbitant. He's about five years old. Uh, we eventually, we hear about Lane, which is a 15-year-old boy, Lane Dawn Creek. And then, of course, we meet Corrine Dawn Creek. Um, they're living in this they're living in a new place but it's an old house and kind of a bad neighborhood and they are very poor very very poor um so they meet with corinne she basically tells them that you know her scion uh her companion scion her lantern companion had passed away due to the hangman we basically end up learning a little backstory about their house um that basically kevin dawn creek had some very rare type of magic some kind of uh, emulation type magic where he uses disease to base diseases, viruses, illnesses to basically uh, perform magic. This, of course, ended up attracting the Lord Hangman because um, the Lord Hangman himself is a very bad guy and he has an aspect of that of a dead man. So he's very interested in necromancy emulation type magic he's very much interested in that type of magics so that's how kevin don creek came on his radar lord hangman wanted him to join him become affiliated with his uh arcana court basically uh kevin don creek turned it down you know lord hangman is not a good guy in fact many people in atlantean society won't even say his name you know kind of like Voldemort and harry potter they just will not say his name because he's just a very bad man you know, they feel if they say his name, they're somehow going to bring him into their circle of influence. Um, so, yeah, basically, Kevin Don Creek did not want to join him. Hangman becomes very mad, ends up killing him, setting the house on fire. Anna and Corby are both hurt in the incident. Um, Corby, of course, speaks with a very hoarse voice. Um, his vocal cords were damaged in the fire. Uh, Anna had half of her face burnt, so she has a big scar on her face from it. Um, and then after that, they moved into a new house. Um, Corrine is basically raising these three kids who are the children of her Atlantean companion who is now dead. Um, they've been living that way for, from what I understand, a couple of years. Well, unfortunately, uh, Lane basically became friends with some prostitutes that live on the Green Dogs. Um, don't know exactly how this all happened, how they became friends, but basically Lane started sneaking out, went to a party, that apparently the Lord Hangman was at, 
and he ended up performing a bit of magic that ended up um, attracting the attention of Lord Hangman. So the Lord Hangman, well, Lane basically has run away. Um, and I guess he ran away to the hangman's court. I don't really know why he did that or what he thought he was trying to do, but basically he's been kidnapped by the hangman. And that's why Corrine has reached out to Rune and Bran to basically get their help to try to get Lane back. And so that's why they're there, uh, to meet with Corrine to get some more information. You know, we have some really good interactions in the scene with Anna and Corby. I feel so bad for Corrine. Because uh, one of the things they talk about is what happens to a companion pair when one of them dies, especially when the Atlantean dies. Um, basically, Atlanteans have long lifespans that translates over to their hu human companions, and they have slower lifespans as well. When the Atlantean companion dies, the human compa companion starts to age very rapidly. You know, you we're talking years going by, aging years within just a single year. So Corrine, you know, she's having trouble. She's aging quite rapidly. Um, she's starting to have health issues. You know, she's struggling to make money, trying to make ends meet, trying to struggling to make money, while at the same time, not being affiliated, you know, really hurts job prospects, makes the family unsafe, and she's trying to keep three children safe. You know, it's a very sad scene, especially considering they are basically Rune's people. You know, they were part of the Sun Court. Um, you know, so while he's been feeling bad all these years, he's forgotten about all these other people that were there on the sidelines who's also not had a very good time since the fall of Sun Court. So they discussed it over. They ended up deciding to help Corrine and her uh, to find Lane. So they agreed to take the job. And they don't tell her that the reason why they're taking the job. The reason they're taking it is so they can get into the sphere of influence of the hangman. Possibly even find some kind of information they can blackmail him with. Um, so, basically, Corrine tells them uh, that there's a guy on the green docks that knows more information. That's where they need to go. Now, the green docks is basically a collection of ships that Atlanteans have basically either stolen or basically conjured up from the depths floor, you know, brought it back up and restored it. And they've turned it into bars and brothels and much more. Um, the closer to shore you are on the green docks, the more touristy the places are. They feature more bars, alcohol, brothels, prostitutes. The further out you go, the more dangerous it becomes. It starts to become more drug dens, a um, lot more specialized type of bars and clubs. There's one where people get tortured. Uh, so it's a very bad place to be. Um, but unfortunately, they have to go there. They have to meet with someone. So they end up going to the place called this place called the Honey Pot, uh, where they can meet with the prostitute to try to get more information on Lane and where he might be. Um, love this scene. It's really good. A scene, you know, it's very interesting with all these ships and you have all these stories and the author, he really did himself great in this section. You know, he actually, the ships that he's talking about are actual real ships that disappeared or went down in some kind of tragedy or storm. You know, you can actually look at the history of these boats. And I just think that's really cool that he took actual history and put it into the book. And it's like, oh, well, now it's part of the Green Docks in New Atlantis. That's really cool. Um, so we go to the Green Docks. Uh, basically, Bran has been here before. From time to time, Bran does like to have a night off. He likes to basically be away from Rune, be out of the bodyguard uh, type mode and just relax. And normal bars just aren't for him. You know, he doesn't want to be socialized. He doesn't want to be bothered. He just wants to go be by himself, have a few drinks. So that's why he likes to go to the Green Dogs. Don't know if he engages in any more than just maybe drinks, but... Uh, He's been there before, and of course this upsets Room. They have a little uh, snippety bits back and forth between them. Eventually they come to an understanding with each other, thanks to Adam, um, and so they continue on. Uh, basically, they go into the honey pot, they meet with the guy, uh, I think it was Sherman Greenwater of the Jade Tide School, and he basically tells him that his cousin Sherman is friends with Lane. And that's how they got all introduced and 
how Lane and Sherman, basically Sherman is a drug addict. So, and he basically took Lane to a party with the hangman and that's how this whole thing started. So, if we need to know more about where Lane is, we need to go find Sherman. So, basically, uh, Kellum, Kellum Greenwater, I don't know if I said his name right the first time or not, uh, basically tells him in order to find Sherman, you need to go further into the Green Docks to a ship called the USS Waratah, I believe. Um, and in the in the brothel on that ship is called the Chained Rock, which which is a play on play on words. Um, so they end up going further into the Green Docks because Brand's never been that far. We have some interesting scenes where you can see ghosts and stuff like that. Where Rune says he can see the ghosts in the past of these different ships and how they went down. You get to see a little bit of the drug use, uh, including one called the Agonies, which will play. Uh, a role in later books and there's even a little section where a woman says uh you know she's coming i forget exactly what she says like she's coming i hope you know you're, she's coming it's about time you know and i knew that was important didn't know exactly how but it plays a role in the third book so we make it to the uss war to the chained chained rock and we basically end up learning that this is not a very good brothel Basically, when you go in there, there's a red door and a blue door. One door you go through, you are permitted to injure someone. And if you go through the other door, you allow permission to be hurt yourself. So this is a very bad bar, and Rune, and Rune does not like it at all. Of course, you know, Bran and Adam, they don't like it either. But Rune really doesn't like it. So they go in, they investigate, or they basically interrogate... Um, Sherman and he tells him about the Lord Hangman tells him about the parties that he Lord Hangman's likes to throw on his American battleship that he has that's located further out in the green docks so after their little interaction there they decided to go to the battleship which is owned by the Hangman which is the USS Declaration it's a World War II battleship again something I love about the author this is a real life battleship you know, it was really built for World War II. Uh, it supposedly went down in some kind of storm. But in here, the author has given it more life, you know, and basically the hangman has found it somehow and brought it to the green docks. Now, the hangman has used magic to basically conceal its existence, and he's basically turned it into his little personal playing ground. So while he's there, Rune ends up discovering what the hangman has been up to, discovers his little secrets. Um, and discovers what he's been doing and it's very bad you know we end up meeting a guy there by the name of pretty boy who uh, the hangman apparently has taken a fascination with and basically locked him away on this ship so and this is a really good scene I love it it's just you're waiting waiting for this a fight to break out you know nothing ever does you know it's a great thriller scene where it just keeps you on the edge of your seat learning all these secrets um, but yeah, I don't want to go into it too much without spoiling exactly what it is the hangman's been up to, but it's very bad. If the Arcana knew what he was up to, there would be trouble. So after that, they end up going back to Edgemere, which is Adam's home apparently. It's a desanctified church that has been converted into apartments. Um, and there they bring uh, Corrine, uh, Corby, and Anna back there for safekeeping because they're not sure exactly what all the hangman knows does he know that rune and bran are you know looking around for him trying to find lane they don't know if he's if lord hangman's knows they've been on the uss declaration you know they don't know exactly what stage in the move lord hangman's at and they don't know if corinne's house has been bugged or if it's being watched so they figured it was best just to bring them back to adam's place while they're there Lord Tower calls, says, Rune, come meet me for dinner or for breakfast. You know, and he, well, he doesn't even say that. He really says, I'm, I'm bringing a car. You know, there's no, hey, want to join me for breakfast? None of that. It's just, I'm sending a car. See you there. <laughs> you know, Lord Tower gets what he wants. <clears throat> so basically, Rune hops in the car. He meets the Lord Tower at a place called The Rivers. It's a very fancy restaurant. And there, basically, the Tower tells him, 
look, you need to stop your advances on the hangman. You need to give up on Corrine and her children. Give up on this boy Lane. Just focus on you, Brand, Max, and Queenie, and Adam and Quinn. You know, basically Rune says that's not going to happen. Um, <clears throat> so after that, they leave. Uh, Rune basically pieces together. And this is what I love about this scene with the towers. There's little breadcrumbs being scattered out all over the place. You know, and they're just unsure. You're unsure what's important and what's not. You know, and Rune knows this. He even mentions it. He's like, you know, every time he has a meal with the tower, he knows secrets are being spilled. You know. Um, so he already knows there's something up with this meeting. There's there's more to it than just, hey, stay out of the hangman's or orbit. <clears throat> so after he has breakfast with the tower, he basically gets a call from Quinn saying, you need to get back to Adam's apartment. We have a situation with uh, Anna. So they go back to the room, gets back to Adam's apartment, and he basically finds out a secret about Anna. A very important secret, a very important secret that has real consequences later on. So basically they're discussing some stuff, doing some research. Turns out Max and Quinn have been also doing the research. Um, basically they discover that Lord Hangman has very few businesses. There's one in particular where they feel Lane might be at. So they decide to go there. This is a fantastic scene. You know, definitely one of my favorite in it. You get to really see where this building has been converted into biospheres. Um, you have a really awesome fight scene uh, with a uh, rune and an Ifrit. Um, and they even get to see a dinosaur <laughs> while they're there. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. And Rune goes flying across the sky, across the city to attack this Ifrit and to kill it. And such a great scene. And you get to see Max, more Max and Quinn there too. And you get to really see more of Quinn's prophetic abilities too. So they're basically successful. successful. They find Lane. Uh, they rescue him. They take him to New Saints Hosp Hospital. Now, New Saints Hospital, that whole scene is my second most favorite scene in the entire book. Um, a lot happens at New Saints. Um, first of all, you get to see how people react to Rune. Um, you know, so when Rune gets to the hospital, he's basically surprised to see everyone there just sitting in the common waiting room. He figured they'd be in the Arcana waiting room. You know, the Ar Arcana have special places in New Atlantis. So he doesn't understand why him and his party aren't in the Arcana waiting rooms, you know, and so he basically goes up and starts questioning the nurses and they kind of do a little pushback and basically he forces the issue. Um, so even though he's not in a sitting Arcana, he still has certain privileges that people are trying to deny him. And I, I really love that he pushed that and really forced that with them. Um, so while they're there at New Saints Hospital, the Lord Hangman ends up ambushing Rune. So basically, um, an administrator comes to Rune and says, look, we have some very bad news about Lane. Could you please follow me? And they basically take him across the hospital to a conference room where he's ambushed by the Hangman. My, this, my, definitely my, this is the reason why this is my second favorite scene in the book is this whole scene with the Hangman. Um, because it's just a lot's being said. You're on the edge of your seat. You don't know exactly when the fight is going to break out. Um, it, yeah, it's a really great scene. And I want to talk more about it in the second portion of the book. But basically, Rune is ambushed by the hangman. Uh, Rune almost dies, you know, in this encounter. And luckily, he is saved by Anna. Um, afterwards, he calls a meeting of the Arcanum in which he wants to air his grievances to the Arcanum against the, uh, the hangman. So <clears throat> afterwards, Rune starts gathering some more information um, with the help of Kieran, who's in Spain. And then we head to the Convocation. Uh, the Convocation is where the Ar Arcanum is. So the, if you don't know the first book, the Convocation is like Congress. You know, there's an elected official body of people where they basically, you know, create the laws and govern New Atlantis. But the Arcanum is there too. It's kind of like the Senate in a way. I don't know. They exist there at the Convocation as well. And that's where they meet up. So 
this section of the book at the convocation in the arcanum is my favorite scene in the book absolute favorite you know and really my favorite scenes are not the action scenes it's the other ones where secrets are being spilled big players are up you're on the edge of your seat this is the biggest part of the book the most on the edge of your seat so here we are gonna meet with all of the arcana you know rune is calling his forum so uh we give going to the convocation you have rune bran adam quinn and max and then of course kieran ends up meeting them there and of course the hangman is trying to stall them you know they have a confrontation with some of the guard of course some of hangman's people and then rune enters the arcanum uh, to basically air his grievances and we get to see all the arcana that are there some of them aren't there physically in person some are just magically like holograms like there but most of them are in person and i love this scene a absolutely love it you have so many you get to see exactly how the arcana you get to see how they look how they act um you get to see how they interact with each other there's secrets being spilt you know the way they look at each other the way they say certain things and you can't room can't speak up and be like hey what do you mean by that you know he just has to sit back and listen and he even mentions you know how he's filing away all these little tidbits of information to think about later on um but yeah and then something very major happens in the arcanum very major um and of course he airs his grievances with the hangman fantastic scene and i'm going to go in more into that scene at, later in the video um but basically after his rune airs his grievances basically and presents his evidence against the hangman hangman goes crazy and basically decides to try to attack and kill everyone and again this is all part of the convocation scene wonderful you get to see how the arcana act in emergency situations you get to see how what powers they are able to use what unique powers are theirs only um basically they manage to survive the convocation attack they make their way to the battleship where even more secrets are divulged even more fighting um, in the pursuit of the hangman who has basically taken refugee on the battleship and, you know and he's trying to go to porthole um so rune the tower lady death uh lady world i think lord hierophant ended up and kieran ended up joining him on going on the battleship to take on the hangman again lots of secrets are, are spilt here lots of fighting a lot of action you know rune does end up winning his battle against the hangman adam is seriously injured um in fact an injury that cannot be healed um yeah and lots of secrets it's really good that probably the battleship area is probably my third most favorite scene in the book so basically we end it uh in the book with him his successfully defeating the hangman max is safe um we're back at the enclave for basically some vacation time well even before that uh rune meets with the lord tower more secrets are divulged uh at the arcanum um and then we go to the enclave where we have basically the end story of it the epilogue or whatever you want to call it um where basically brand gets a five-story battle gunship and rune ends up with a dinosaur <laughs> so yeah this this is my absolute favorite favorite book in the series i mean just so much happens so many secrets are divulged and you have so many other characters that have come into the mix like the dawn creeks i love lady death absolutely love her you know and we get to see more interactions with the tower which in the first book i was very unsure about him this book it's definitely I'm, he's starting to warm up to me at this point so i would highly check this out if you like the first book i would definitely really recommend this one this one is even better than the first one and there are so many secrets you get a lot of questions answered about the first book but then you also have a whole nother list of questions that come up because of this so i'm going to include everything in the description down below a link to where you can buy this book i'm also going to include a link to katie edwards website where you can get your whole get your hands on some free stories including the sunken mall which i mentioned at the beginning of the video so yeah i hope i summed it up pretty well um this next portion that i'm going to do i'm going to go into much more detail much more spoiler stuff about the story that i would love to hear y'all's opinion on 
So if you haven't read it, stop the video right here. If you have read it, then please continue on and let's dive into some deeper stuff about this book. All right. So now let's get into the spoiler heavy section of this video. Um, the first thing that I found really interesting in this book is actually in the first chapter where Rune is on Sun Estate. Um, I want to know how companions are chosen. You know, is it a family that that's part of what they do is they breed companions? Or was there some other reason Lord Tower, not Lord Tower, but Lord Sun was looking into Bran's family and how he chose Bran? Um, that is something I would really like to know more of. Um, we get a little bit of information, you know, from Room, but not a whole lot on that subject. The next thing is at Half House in the second chapter where Max is abducted um, <clears throat> by the hangman, hangman's people, and basically Rune and Bran are running through the city, and of course they get a phone call from Quinn. This is something I've been a little, have difficulty seeing is how Quinn's ability works. We do see some more of that in the Edelon, and we get a lot better understanding of Quinn and how his ability works. But you would think he would have saw this event with Max, and he could have warned Rune and been like, hey, you know, the hangman's going to try to get a hold of him, make sure he don't go outside, something. But the, it kind of almost seems like Quinn did not see this event happening. And it wasn't until the last minute did he realize what's happening, and that's why he called Rune. Now, we could be wrong. You know, we do see later in the book. Quinn does seem to be stacking the deck in his favor. So it's possibly all along he knew this was going to happen. And that's why him and Adam were nearby. But that is something I find very strange is his abilities. You know, I wish we get a little bit more information on that and how he sees stuff. Um, the next uh, thing I wanted to talk about is actually at the Dawn Creeks. Um, and I actually, I've read this the first few times I've read through it. But it wasn't until you read the third book does it start to make more sense. But we end up learning that the Dawn Creeks were affiliated with the greater house um, of the Ambersons. That Kevin Dawn Creek was affiliated with the Ambersons. And that they were the father's magical studies branch. And Lord Ambersons were the one who elevated the Dawn Creeks and made them a lesser house. Um, that... if. I don't want to give away stuff that's going to happen in the third book, but that is important, I think. You know, I did not realize that connection until I went through and reread it. Um, I guess there's really not much I can talk about that without giving away stuff in the third book, but that is important that the Ambersons are connected to this. Um, and then there was. Another thing I wanted to talk about later in the book is on page 86, Rune ends up mentioning they're still at the Dawn Creek's house and basically Corrine has gone out to go try to get information from Sherman to find out where Lane is. And uh, Rune and Bran stay behind to watch Corby and Anna and they're talking about cooking some food and Rune makes a comment, uh, Bran says, you can't cook. And Rune says, can't I? We must have cooked before Queenie, right? You know, and then he makes a comment, I tried to remember what we did before Queenie came along. Again, this comes back to this whole question of who is Queenie? You know, what is she doing? You know, anytime they ask Rune and Bran how they met Queenie or how long they've known her, they always say forever. You know, that, that, that's not an answer. That doesn't make any sense. And here we have another situation where they can't remember if they've ever cooked before Queenie. And I'm like, there's some kind of memory thing going on. I don't know who Queenie is. Something's going on. I, I, I want to know more, more about her. And of course, we don't learn nothing else in this book about her. Um, <clears throat> then later on, we're on the green docks and we're in the honey pot uh, and basically Rune that scared the crap out of the dream sprites. And so they end up giving him a corduroy button, which again, it's one of those weird pieces of puzzle, weird information the author puts out there that doesn't get talked anywhere else in the book. So I wonder if this corduroy button is gonna play a role at some point later on in the story. Now I did see a little podcast with the author, Katie Edwards. He did mention 
uh, that the corduroy button will come into play later on. Um, so I just wonder exactly what's going on there. What what kind of secret is that button going to hold? I don't think it's a magical. I don't think it's like a sigil or any kind of ward or anything like that. Because Rune is very good at sensing magic. Um, so if it had some kind of magic, he would know. I think it would just be more of a sign of friendship. You know, maybe he's going to be in a dangerous situation with some fearsome creature. And he's going to pull out the corduroy bucket. Corduroy button. <laughs> You know, and then he's going to be like, oh, well, your friend, no longer an enemy. I, th I think that's what's going to happen. Um, then, of course, later on in the green docks, we have that drug addict who says she comes. You know that she comes. It's time. You know, again, piece of information that you know is important, but you don't know why. But if you read the third book, you will know. Um, and then let's see. Oh, and then we have where they Rune meets with Sherman, and they're talking about the battleship. Um, and basically, uh, Adam ends up learning that this battleship, the USS Declaration, is a sister to a ship, the USS North Carolina, that him and Quinn went and visited a couple of months before. Um, this is definitely a good scene where you can show that Quinn is stacking the deck in his favor. And again, it makes you wonder, how far can he actually see into the future? Um, I mean, theoretically, I guess he could see all the way. I, I guess. I, I don't really know. His, his abilities are just such a mystery. Like, I think it's somehow connected to him. So he could only see events that have happened in his lifetime in the future. But I, I don't know. And, you know, and here's an instance where he is literally stacking in his favor made sure Adam knew the ship because he knew what was going to happen in the future. And it just makes you wonder how often he does that and how far he can see into the future. Um, and then you have the scene with Rune and Lord Tower at the Rivers restaurant. I love that scene. You know, you get to see a little bit of the tower and how he reacts. And yeah, I just love that interaction with Rune and the tower. I think it's all anytime in Arcana, is involved I just absolutely love that scene I think that's why I love this book is so many arcana come in to the playing field um, let's see here oh and then later on on page 236 Kieran is trying to dream walk into Rune's mind or trying to connect Rune to his mind and they end up basically going into Max's mind and we get to see a little scene where Max and his grandmother, uh, where Max is trying to use magic or trying to use cantrips and he's not doing very well and Elena becomes very upset. This scene, I would love to know more about what happened to Max. I hope we get to see more in a series of what his background is and why Elena thought he was important. You know, she was very convinced he was going to be the Arcana for the lovers. And in fact, I still think he, he, he could be. He is getting stronger, you know, he's getting better with magic. I think he just needed the right people around him, um, you know, and I don't think he really had that in the lover's court, but now that he's in the sun court, I think he has the right people. To, I, I think he could end up becoming an arcana and end up coming the next arcana for the lover's throne. But yeah, I mean, there's something special about him. I would love to know more on why Lady Lovers is so why Max is so important to her. Um, but yeah, that was a little good scene to show a little bit of Elena Lovers back in the mix. Um, let's see here. Oh, I, I completely forgot. I, I skipped right over it. So while this whole scene, I can't remember if that whole little scene with Max, if that happened, before the ambush with Lord Hangman? I don't think so. Yes, okay. So a little scene with Max and Kieran being in his dream, that happened before Rune is ambushed by the Hangman. So now we are at Lord New Saints Hospital. Uh, Rune basically gets called to go meet with the administrator about Lane and he's ambushed and runs into Lord Hangman. Now I talked about how this was my second favorite scene in the series. Uh, and this is why, and I don't, think it's because of exactly what's it is what's happening in the room but it's also what's happening outside so 
I love how Rune is very much on edge. He's trying to be very formal. He's trying to make sure he doesn't say the wrong thing to get instantly get killed by the hangman. You know, and while this is all going on, you know, Rune ends up sending an email to the Arcanum calling for uh, a meeting of all the Arcana. And during that going on, suddenly his phone starts ringing and the hangman's phone starts ringing and neither of them answer. Then Rune's phone stops ringing, but Lord Hangman's keeps keeps ringing. And then suddenly he gets a text message, I think, from the tower or something like that. And the Hangman leaves. I absolutely love that whole scene, how on edge Rune is and how tight of a rope he is walking with the Hangman. But what I think it really is really interesting to think about is what's happening outside that room. Imagine being in Arcana and receiving that email from Rune. Like, I've thought about that. Like, what would it be like to be in the room with the tower and he suddenly received that email? Because, I mean, he sent that email out in literally less than a minute. The tower is calling, you know? So, and it makes you wonder how many bells are going off around New Atlantis. Like, as soon as Rune sends that email, I mean, are people just running about, screaming, hollering, you know, running to the arcana, being like, crap has hit the fan? Yeah, I mean, it's just really interesting to think about, you know, how many Arcana are watching Rune, how many people saw this email come through immediately and began jumping into action. I mean, you know, Lord Tower was probably screaming at Mayan, like, get to Rune now, find out where he is at. Um, <clears throat> such a good scene, such a good thing to think about what's happening outside. And then, of course, the hangman uses the mass sigil to basically make Rune stop voluntarily breathing, you know. And then, of course, we run in. He makes it out of the conference room, goes down the elevator, starts to pass out, and then, of course, Lord Tower uses some kind of magic to tap into the companion bond to get Bran to go help him. And Anna shows up. Again, love, love this whole scene. Anna ends up throwing Bran's ass down the hallway <laughs> to break that spell. <clears throat> fantastic I absolutely love that and it makes you wonder exactly how powerful Anna really is you know and of course Rune even talks about it with Bran that she is so incredibly powerful he talks about it more than once in the book but to have her display such power at such a young age I, I just love it when Anna just takes over and just goes crazy with her powers and I just loved how she just chunked Bran down the hallway <laughs> that was just so awesome um, and then, of course, after this, we have the Arcanum. Um, right at the very beginning, when we're entering the Arcanum, there's something about a Jur Whalen. I don't remember where I saw it because I'd actually marked it. Yeah, it says Quinn was looking around with a smile, basically, as as they passed a group of people with picket signs arguing for the release of Jur Whalen, a convocation representative. Uh, who was recently arrested on corruption charges. I, I don't know who this Drew Whalen is. I think it is mentioned in the Edelon more about who this representative is. But I just wonder if more is going to come into play in this. Or if it was just kind of like a simple little side note, simple detail. You know, like, oh, there's always corruption, you know, uh, in government. So let's just throw this out there. Some basic controversy. I don't know. Um... But yeah, I love this whole scene at the Arcanum. This is my most favorite scene in the book. This whole this whole really section of the convocation area before they go to the battleship. You know, going into the Arcanum, seeing all those Arcana. Absolutely love Lady Death. Freaking love her. Um, and then of course, there's some little speak secrets being spilt. You know, like, you know, you have the Emperor who's died, the Empress who's been exiled. I want to know more about why the Empress had, didn't return to New Atlantis. Why did she go off in the ex exile? And I think it was voluntary. You know, I want to know more about that. And then, of course, uh, you have Lady Death, where they talked about the Dewiger, Lady Death, was wounded in the Atlantean War, which allowed her daughter, Lady Death, to step up and take the throne. I, I want to know more about... Lady Dewagger, the Dewagger Lady Death. How exactly was she injured? I have an idea that has to deal with the Arcana Major. Um, 
I think she maybe used too much of it or something, and that's why she had to step down. Not entirely sure. I would like to know more about that. And then, of course, we learned about the red pages, which, again, not exactly sure what those are. I think they did explain it more in the third book. Um, but I think they're just like basically uh, confidential, top secret type files like the government would have. Um, but it makes you wonder what's in those red pages. Um, and then let's see here. Rune takes his oath. Absolutely love that. Loves when he stands up and takes his oath. Um, then, of course, you know, they go into the whole Arcana Major and what that is. Fantastic. Um, and then, of course, Rune begins airing his grievances against the Lord Hangman. I absolutely love, love that. Love that whole scene. And then, of course, when he accuses him of using time magic and the ju I think it's Lord Strength. Maybe it was Lord Judgment or Lord Strength. I don't remember which one it was. Um, basically started losing his crap about the time magic. And it makes you wonder what is so bad about time magic that it would be a forbidden... I mean, other than the obvious, you know, going back in time, creating a paradox that can't be good. But it seems like there's more to it, more to this time magic that is reason it's, it's uh, forbidden. So, but yeah, love that. Love it when they get attacked and they're fighting for their lives against the winter, winter banshees. Fantastic scenes. And then, of course, Quinn has a little run in with the tower about prophecies and says other kinds of stuff like, I don't see ocean waves the size of skyscraper, skyscrapers around you. I see them around him. Again, we keep coming back to prophecy. I would love to hear more about these prophecies. And we know that the lady who called Rune a Versa Plurka. Pulchra? Yeah, it's Volsa Pulchra. Um, there's more to that prophecy than what we know. So I would like to hear the whole prophecy from start to finish. Um, and then after this, we end up going to the battleship um, where Rune, or not Rune, but Quinn actually ends up saying that, you know, the tears in time can cause other things to walk through. Goes right back to I was wondering why time magic was forbidden other than the obvious. So what is it that can come through? Now, because I've read the third book, I already know what they're talking about. But when I first read this, I was thinking like interdimensional beings or maybe creatures that live in the time stream could end up coming through and causing major trouble for them. Um, so yeah, I, I really love that little bit of detail and information that was left behind. Um, and then there's also another curious thing that happens on this battleship that I just now noticed in my last read through is you have Quinn who talks about Corby's alone. Um, he's basically in the barber shop uh, on the ship and that someone by the name of the hemp spider wanted to separate Corby from Anna. Excuse me. Who is this hemp spider? You know, I haven't encountered it anywhere else in the novel. I mean, Lady Justice has an aspect of a spider, of an arachnid, but no one else has been described in that manner. And I thought it was Jervin, the Seneschal, uh, for Hangman, but I, that's not right because Quinn has called German Jervin the Scarred Man. That's his name for him, it's the Scarred Man. So who is the hemp spider i mean they're not talking about lord hangman i have a feeling this is going to come into play later on unless i've missed something let me know if you know who the hemp spider is referring to in this section because i honestly don't know i think it's something we'll encounter uh later on kind of like fiddler blue you know we came across that and i think in the first book we end up learning more about her in the later books so and then, of course, later on, Hannah, or not Hannah, <laughs> Anna uh, ends up displaying a bit more magic when she makes Kareen her companion. Um, and it talks about the sound of massive wings um, and then the roar of thunder. The, when I read this, I knew this was important, but I didn't know why. And in fact, I read it through several times, never picked up on it. Wasn't until the short story with uh, the principality, Kieran, where he goes to Magnus Academy to argue with the, basically to fight with one of Anna's teachers. When we learn out, learn about Anna's aspect, that she has an aspect. 
Um, and this is the physical manifestation of that. Um, yeah, I just did not put that together until I read that short story. I should have seen that. Um, that that was her aspect, the massive wings and the thunder. I just thought it was something happening on the ship, like a spell or something being broken. You know, I didn't really think that was Anna herself. But yeah, if you did not catch up on that, don't feel bad. I did not catch that either until the short story. Um, then, of course, later on, we talk about Rune is meeting with the tower in the Arcanum and he discusses the Arcana Major, you know, and how it harms him and Bran. I already figured that was something because he talks about how he, every time he uses magic without a sigil, it eats away at his life. So I already assumed the Arcana Major is a bigger form of that. Like when he shoots fireballs, you know, and creates his little sword, you know, all those little cantrips that he does. I figured Arcana Major is just a really big cantrip, basically. And then he talks about the Versa Pulchra, which uh, we basically end up learning that it means the most compelling man in a generation, not the most beautiful. Um, and we know there's more to that prophecy. And I, I really want to know more about that. Um, and then, of course, the tower talks about how Rune's father was his closest friend and that he misses him. I really think Lord Tower and Rune's father were in a rom romantic relationship. Now, I could be just reading into stuff, but Atlantean society is notoriously notoriously bisexual, along with group marriages are very common. And the way the Tower misses him and cares for him and cares for Rune and the Sun Court, I really think they had a romantic relationship because it's mentioned more than once about how the tower loves to paint and he's given several paintings to Rune's father. And the way he took in Rune and Bran, and he's always watched over him, he's always tried to take care of him. He even tells Rune, you know, that he won't tell him all of the prophecies or tell him everything he knows that's meant for Rune to find out himself. But when the time comes, he will be there at Rune's side. So I really think Rune's father and Lord Tower probably had a romantic relationship. And in a way, Lord Tower feels Rune is kind of like his son. Um, you know, and he even talks about how he did not do very good with his own children, especially Dalton, which I actually have a theory about Dalton, which I'm going to talk about in my vi book about the third, in my video about the third book. So, because I have some theories about Dalton. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's basically it. The different sections I really wanted to talk because I'm about to talk about New Saints Hospital and the scene with Lord Hangman. Really wanted to talk about the Arcanum. Freaking love that. You know, all, oh, and I love Lady Death. You know, she is, she's like my second favorite Arcana is dealing with Lady Death. But uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this book. If you have any scenes that I may have forgot about that you want to talk about or you want to mention, any theories about different things, feel free to put them in the comments below. Um, I would love to hear them and I will try to reply to them as soon as I see them. But uh, yeah, thank you for joining me and I will see you next time.